Hello, and welcome to Green Tea with D-Man, episode 1.6, Antonio Salazar, The Opposition. Now that we have covered the new state structure, leadership, constitutional framework, and organizations, we can pivot this week to covering the main opposition elements to Antonio Salazar and his regime. The early 1930s were an especially stressful time for Prime Minister Salazar, with several close calls, assassination attempts, and attempted coups occurring between 1933 to 1937. It was quite bad for Salazar, to the point that in November 1933, the German legation to Portugal stated, Salazar's position is contested, and he must forever be imposing himself against adverse forces. These centers of opposition can be broken down into three main groups. The conservative Republicans, who wish to see a return to the Republic in some form, and comprise both military officers and civilians. Secondly, the national syndicalists, who were largely leftovers from the Lusitanian integralists, and to varying degrees attempted to absorb elements of Italian fascism, German national socialism, and Spanish phalangism. And thirdly, the red menace, which would always be a thorn in the regime's side, the leftists, i.e. communists and socialists. We will get more into the leftist opposition to Salazar as we drift on towards episode 1.7, which will highlight Portugal and the Spanish Civil War, and then again as World War II ended through to the end of Antonio Salazar's life. Before we start with the three main opponents of the Estado Novo, I want to share some words directly related to this episode from Salazar, who, in fighting back against the varying ideological dissidents in Portugal, declared, we are opposed to all forms of internationalism, communism, socialism, syndicalism, and everything which may divide or minimize or break up the family. We are against class warfare, irreligion, and disloyalty to one's own country, against serfdom, a materialistic conception of life, and might over right. The Republicans were strongest from the time Salazar cemented his position as finance minister in 1928 until about 1933, as Salazar integrated elements into his regime and the political space occupied by the Republicans was increasingly absorbed into that of the national syndicalists. It is more accurate to suggest that the last major grasp for the Republicans to retain power occurred in 1931. As we mentioned before, there was a failed coup by the Republicans in 1931, which started in the Atlantic Islands and spread to Portuguese Guinea. In August of that year, the Republicans and Freemasons actually formed a temporary alliance with the Communists and attempted an uprising in Lisbon, which resulted in the deaths of about 40 people. Seeing how much of a threat the Republicans were to his own position, President Carmona increasingly turned toward the influence of both Salazar and the younger officers preaching the National Syndicalist line. If you remember from the beginning of our episodes on Salazar, President Carmona was actually a Republican, but at the end of the day, he was now president, and was above all, a Nationalist Army officer. The usefulness of the National Union, which was primarily made up of Old Guard Republicans, greatly declined after the Constitutional Plebiscite in March of 1933, and then would continue to a near flatline as we mentioned in episode 1.5c. What is interesting is that the National Union, while serving a purpose to mobilize just enough to pass the new constitution, was actually bitterly opposed by some of the diehard Republicans, as they realized it meant the death of any return to Republican government. Nonetheless, the constitutional plebiscite passed with an absolute majority of 95% approval. Republican opposition to Antonio Salazar in the new state came from several areas in academic, military, and First Republic political circles. Men like Kunha Liao, who we mentioned back in episode 1.4, used his wealth and political connections to create a support group in the late 1920s through the Liberal Republican Union in order to try and bolster Republican officials in the military dictatorship against the national syndicalists and Salazarists. There were even some districts in Portugal, such as Vila Real, where Kunha Liao's supporters dominated the local commissions of the National Union. But Salazar's efforts to keep the party from mobilizing worked perfectly. Afonso Costa was another former politician and Republican who was able to form a gathering against Salazar. 
former finance minister and prime minister Costa, was seen as the opposition's trump card, since besides Salazar, he was the only other living Portuguese politician who had managed to balance the Portuguese budget, which he did during the years of the First Republic. A fellow Coimbra alumni, Costa was as determined to fight against Salazar as Cunha Leal was, but whereas Cunha Leal was sent to exile in the Azores, Costa found himself eventually exiled to Spain, where he was accused of working with Spain's Republican president, Manuel Azaña, to undermine Portuguese sovereignty and Salazar's regime, an issue we will get into in episode 1.7 when we cover Portugal and the Spanish Civil War. In the meantime, Costa penned allegations against Salazar in the summer of 1934 through a Brazilian journalist named José Jobim. These allegations were refuted by official notes in the press, a press which increasingly towed the line and supported Antonio Salazar against all opposition, to the point that by mid-1936, as the Spanish Civil War kicked off, Afonso Costa and most other Republican dissidents were marginalized and exiled to Spain or France, where they formed opposition leagues, such as the Paris-based Defense League of the Republic, with men such as Alvaro de Castro and José Domínguez dos Santos, or the Republican Socialist Alliance. Costa would eventually pass away in Paris in 1937, at the age of 66. The Republican Socialist Alliance was an attempt by Republicans and Socialists to form a front against Salazar and included many military officers, such as Admiral Tito de Marais, Naval Officer Mendez Cabachetas, and General Norton de Matos. Mendez Cabachetas had actually been an original member of the Triumvirate, which overthrew the First Republic in 1926. Along with General Gomez de Costa and Armando Ochoa, Cabachetas helped direct the first selection of cabinet ministers and was there with de Costa when Salazar was chosen the first time to be finance minister. Eventually, he had a falling out with de Costa as Cabachetas was a devout Republican, which did not sit well with General de Costa. General Norton de Matos was an army officer who had served as the high commissioner in Angola, where he made a strong name for himself by getting things done in the colony. He was involved in rumblings of a coup, along with our old pal Colonel, now promoted to General, Vicente Fritas, against Salazar during the early 1930s, and would eventually run for president in 1949 with the support of dissidents such as Rolao Preto. Among the other military officers who opposed Salazar were two consecutive war ministers from 1934 to 1936, before Salazar outmaneuvered them and named himself war minister. These were General Luis Alberto de Oliveira and General Passos de Sousa. Yes, the same General Sousa who had tried to convince Salazar to join him in a military coup against Acosta way back in the late 1920s. War Minister Alberto de Oliveira was a highly respected and acclaimed officer who had served in Africa and France during World War I, in addition to serving in the administration of President Sidonio Pais and was eventually made the civil governor of Coimbra. In 1930, he was promoted to commander of the Elite Hunters 5 military unit, which was known as the most politically reliable unit at the dictatorship's disposal. As such, General Oliveira had some clout, and he managed to work his way into President Carmona's administration as the war minister in 1934. Minister Oliveira felt threatened by the increasing authoritarian and personal power of Antonio Salazar, and this led him to overplaying his hand during a speech commemorating President Carmona's sixth anniversary as President of the Republic. Speaking to Carmona and the military, whilst being egged on by some of the junior and more pro-fascist officers, Minister Oliveira openly criticized Antonio Salazar while affirming that the war minister was solely responsible to President Carmona. Things hit a fevered pitch when rumors circulated that several military units promised to defend Oliveira from any retaliation by Salazar. So what did Prime Minister Salazar do when confronted with this situation? Well, that tried and true method of getting Carmona to back him over rivals. He resigned his position and headed back to Santa Combadao for a little R&R. &R. As it happened several times before, President Carmona sided with Prime Minister Salazar and promised to support him against any threats from the military. After the temperature of the situation died down in October of that year, 
Salazar went ahead and made Minister Oliveira involuntarily resign and head back to the barracks of Hunters 5. The next poor schmuck to try his hand at gambling against our central character, Antonio Salazar, was General Paso de Sousa. General turned war minister Sousa epitomized the go big or go home mentality. Now why do I say that? Well, the guy wanted Portugal to somehow scrounge enough cash together to pay for the upkeep of a 500,000 man army. So at this point in time, that was an army larger than Germany's, despite Portugal having a population of only 7 million people and Germany having like 80 million. Granted, Germany was still throwing off the shackles of the Treaty of Versailles, which had limited its army to only 100,000 soldiers. Anyways, Minister Sousa was a thorn in Salazar's side, and the guy really wasn't living in the same world as Salazar or the other many civilian ministers who Salazar had brought in. A large army was expensive and would have a negative effect on the Portuguese economy. In addition, the Council of Ministers had met several times in February 1936 and agreed to a smaller, more professional army than what Minister Sousa wanted. In addition, in a memorandum from the Portuguese Foreign Minister, Armindo Monteiro, Portugal's diplomatic situation was on the rise, and she had good relations with the European powers, such as Italy, Germany, France, and, of course, the United Kingdom. Raising some monstrously ridiculous army would not only bankrupt the country, just that it had finally become a shining light to the rest of the world after years of turmoil, but it would also create tension with the other powers, especially those sharing colonial borders with Portugal. After several months, it became clear that Minister Sousa and his angst against the civilian ministers had failed in implementing the reorganization of the army as agreed to by the Council of Ministers. Paso de Sousa then fired off an angry letter to Salazar, complaining that he had not been aware there was a unanimous decision to reorganize into a smaller army. In this futile attempt to resist the Council of Ministers and Salazar, Sousa overplayed his hand, and at the urging of the younger officers who would profit from the reorganization of the army, think of old generals being forced into retirement and younger generals taking over those positions, Minister Sousa tendered his resignation on May 9, 1936. Antonio Salazar then picked up the war portfolio and made himself war minister, but he appointed a junior officer, Captain Fernando Santos Costa, as Undersecretary of War, who would serve him loyally for the next 25 years. After the Republicans, we have the traditional political spectrum of leftists, that being the large grouping of communists, socialists, anarcho-syndicalists, and libertarians. In the 1930s, none of these groups were well organized or boasted strong numbers, with perhaps the exception being an attempted uprising in January 1934, and as we will talk about in the case of the Spanish Civil War, the anarcho-syndicalists and libertarians were easily dispatched due to the nature of their ideologies, putting them at a massive disadvantage when confronted with any type of organized force. In Portugal, the leftists fought back against the 1933 constitution for varying reasons. Communists and socialists were especially furious over the lack of a resolution in the constitution regarding the relationship between capital and labor. The anarcho-syndicalists and libertarians fought back as they realized Salazar's goal was the strengthening of the state. The problem for the leftist dissidents in Portugal was that they faced the entire weight of censorship and repression from the government, which proved insurmountable when they launched an uprising on January 18, 1934. In addition, the leftists had to fight for its blue-collar base against fascists. The reason why? Rolau Preto and the National Syndicalist Movement felt that the Portuguese working class was a priority in implementing the corporative structure and as such sought to support and build up the working class. This of course presented a near existential threat to the leftists, and as such the socialists and communists were forced to divert much of their energy to attack, both physically and ideologically, the national syndicalists who were taking their working class supporters. Already fragmented by opposition to one another and to the regime along with the fascists, the leftists really couldn't mobilize any meaningful resistance. There was no legal mechanism by 1936 for leftists to rally against the regime, and this would lead to violent attacks and attempted assassination attempts on Salazar in 1936 and 1937, which we will cover in episode 1.7 since it directly relates to Spanish leftists 
attempting to destabilize Salazar. However, I will mention here in this episode that Portuguese exiles living in Spain were caught in 1934 receiving weapons from Manuel Azaña, who at that time was the war minister in Republican Spain, and would go on to be the prime minister and then president of Spain during the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. Last episode, I mentioned there was a naval mutiny that occurred a week before the creation of the Portuguese Legion. There were two Portuguese ships, the Afonso de Albuquerque and the Dow. Both of these ships were relatively new to the fleet as they had been part of the naval resurgence under Salazar's guidance with the ships launched in 1934. On the morning of September 8th, both ships laid at anchor in the harbor of Lisbon up the Tagus River. The Spanish Civil War had been going on for about a month and a half at this point, and as such, emotions were running high, as Salazar's regime had begun a massive crackdown on the remaining leftists within the country, as well as Spanish leftists who were crossing into Portugal with other refugees. The mutiny was supposedly led by a sailor named Manuel Guedes, who was a member of the leftist group, the Revolutionary Organization of the Fleet, which had ties to the Portuguese Communist Party, and was in direct contact with Spanish communists. Before the mutiny occurred at 3 a.m., a wireless operator loyal to the Estado Novo tipped off the Portuguese admiralty. The original plan had been for the rebels to take over most of the ships at anchor, as well as the shore batteries on the Tagus, and make a run for it and defect to Republican Spain. Some rumors have it that they had actually meant to force the resignation of Antonio Salazar, but since their plan didn't work, will continue on. With the Admiralty tipped off, and most of the fleet remaining loyal to the Estado Novo, the Afonso de Albuquerque and the Dow were on their own and ended up coming under devastating fire from the shore batteries, as well as a Portuguese submarine hitting the Afonso with one of its torpedoes. Both ships ran aground, and the rebels were forced to surrender. While on a personal level, Salazar must have been deeply upset to hear of the mutiny on two of the fleet's newest ships, including one named for his childhood dog. But it came clear that he was firmly in control when he published the following note on the mutinous vessels to the nation. Their construction was ordered with that clarity of conscience which only the pursuit of duty can create, although they were paid for by the labor of a whole people. It was with the same imperturbable serenity that I ordered them to be shelled until they either surrendered or sank. The reason, which stands taller than any other sentiment, was this. The ships of the Portuguese Navy can be sent to the bottom of the sea, but they cannot serve under any flag other than that of Portugal. In a single moment, many months' savings were wasted, it is true, but we cannot restrict our actions by such considerations when the honor of the nation is at stake. As we have gone through this episode, and the ones prior involving Rolau Preto and the National Syndicalists, it should have become clear that Preto and Salazar were not friends nor allies, Salazar represented a more Catholic conservative ideology, while the national syndicalists were the Portuguese fascist identity. Despite these differences and the open conflict between Salazar and Preto, the leftists in Portugal actually went all out in propaganda to try and convince the public that the Salazar regime was actually bankrolling the national syndicalists and that most of the leaders and members on the left actually believed Salazar was propping up the National Syndicalists in some kind of conspiracy to thwart the proletarian uprising. Although the Socialists would eventually lay claim to victory by overthrowing the Estado Novo in the Carnation Revolution of 1974, they mounted little resistance to Salazar during the 1930s, with exception to the violence which engulfed Spain and somewhat spilled over to Portugal between 1936 to 1939. Lastly, we arrive to the National Syndicalists, in some circles identified as the fascist opposition to Antonio Salazar. There was some overlap between Salazarism and the National Syndicalist, but some of this overlap was due to Salazar intentionally outmaneuvering Rolau Preto, and the rest was due to the core foundation of Charles Maras in both men's political views. The National Syndicalist movement was born out of the Lusitanian Integralist movement, which, while it did have its own nationalist foundation, it also took some inspiration from Italian fascism, German national socialism, and Spanish phalangism. 
While Lusitanian integralism was based on the political reactionary works of Charles Maras and traditional monarchism, the National Syndicalist Movement adopted a neo-traditional corporatist view and ethno-historical nationalism which fit a Latin nation such as Portugal. In addition, Lusitanian integralism represented a backward-looking intellectual ideology by the 1920s, but the National Syndicalist presented a forward-looking mobilizing character, one which obviously ran counter to Salazar's belief that the masses should be demobilized in regards to political activity. The National Syndicalist Movement was officially launched in the summer of 1932 under the leadership of Rolau Preto. Economically, the National Syndicalists were vehemently anti-capitalist. They believed that finance capital, with no respect to limits, led to the death of small businesses and the proletarianization of the working classes, and as such was the source of all evil and injustice. Rolau Preto spoke for the working class in both rural and urban settings, and he warned them that liberal capitalism would lead to a world owned by faceless capitalists who would empty the countryside and transform Portuguese society into a giant agglomeration of proletarians and service employees. Preto wrote of capitalism, parliamentarism, and centralization, saying, In order to dominate politics, liberal democracy centralizes and concentrates the profits of governing the country in a few hands. Something I want to mention before we get into the direct details of opposition to Salazar was that by 1933, the socio-professional makeup of the National Syndicalist Movement was actually quite balanced, as its largest share of members were almost split equally between blue-collar workers and white-collar employees. Fascism in Portugal was able to attain a spectacular balance amongst its supporters before Salazar divided and conquered Preto's movement. Since the National Syndicalists emphasized mobilization of the masses, they of course held large public rallies, much to the agitation of Prime Minister Salazar, who commented after a National Syndicalist rally on May 28, 1933, that they were people who were, quote, always agitated, excited, and discontented, and who would continue to demand the impossible, shouting, more, more. The main beef that Preto had with Salazar, aside from the fact that Preto wanted to gain absolute power, was that being the ideological purist he was, he felt Salazar was being too pragmatic or moderate in his governance. Writing in a series of articles, he labeled Salazar as a man of the center when the leaders of the nations freed from Europe's ruins everywhere dress as a sign of their faith and military virtues in a uniform or in a combat shirt. Salazar was a financial savior, but he was no revolutionary leader. Ultimately, the view was that Antonio Salazar was a conservative but Preto was the fascist revolutionary needed to take Portugal to glorious heights. Too bad for him, he would never make it to those glorious heights. As the National Syndicalists gained popularity and mobilized more members in 1933, violence broke out as they came under attack from Antifa elements. This is a mirror image of what occurred to Oswald Mosley and his British Union of Fascists in the United Kingdom in the mid-1930s, as Antifa began violently attacking his rallies, when the BUF gained traction in British politics. Turn on the news here in the U.S. lately, and you will hear Antifa continues to violently attack everyone, ranging from videographers, to people waving the American flag, to even police horses. By 1933, Salazar and his loyalists in the Council of Ministers recognized the threat posed by the National Syndicalists, as their numbers and influence within the regime was more powerful than that of the National Union. As a result, the government decided to sow seeds of secession within the National Syndicalist Movement, as there were many members who were not opposed to Antonio Salazar, and felt that by working within the government structure, they could push the Estado Novo further to the third position and implement many of their goals. Starting in May 1933, Salazar worked to bring friendly elements, mainly those within the National Syndicalist Movement's Grand Council, into an agreement with the National Union and the regime. The leader of the secessionist wing was José Cabral, who, never holding any real power within the national syndicalist hierarchy, he proved to be influential due to his close ties with Salazar, as the majority of those within the national syndicalist movement willing to work with the regime were actually graduates and professors of the University of Coimbra. Feeling the heat and pressure coming down on him and the blue shirts, 
or allow Preto reached out to the figure he felt could provide him the most protection from Salazar, President Carmona. On June 7, 1933, President Carmona officially received Preto in his office and assured him that all nationalists had a role to play in the new political situation created by the 1926 coup. Within 13 months of meeting with Carmona, Rolao Preto and the National Syndicalist Movement would cease to function. In November 1933, the split finally occurred within the party as Jose Cabral attempted to pivot the movement toward solidarity with Antonio Salazar, only to have his motion defeated by the more fascist and revolutionary elements of the party. As a result, Cabral and the other moderates from the Grand Council and commissions of the movement met with Salazar and the UN and agreed, with backing of the state, to represent national syndicalist interests within Portugal under the umbrella of the Estado Novo regime. In return, Salazar claimed to support the new group under Cabral, but really it appears Prime Minister was playing politics as masterfully as he'd always done, and from November 1933 until July 1934, he would censor the national syndicalist newspapers, including its primary one, The Revolution, he would ban rallies of the blue shirts, co-opt many of its leaders, and of course undercut their initiatives with the creation of the youth group, the Student Vanguard Association, and finally, through corporative legislation. Salazar was sure to move at an appropriate pace to prevent a sudden shock, which could have led to retaliation by pro-national syndicalist members in the government and military. During the spring of 1934, the national syndicalists clashed with its secessionist elements as well as the pro-government supporters. Rallies were increasingly shut down by the police, and Preto resorted to public attacks against Salazar, but it was too late for him. In a last-ditch effort, Rolao Preto asked President Carmona to personally intervene in order to guarantee freedom of action for the national syndicalists, but Carmona refused, seeing it as an attempt by Preto to divide the government. Several leading members of the national syndicalists, to include the general secretary, Alberto Manzares, were arrested and egged on by the secessionists who wished to see the National Syndicalist Movement shut down, Antonio Salazar held a long meeting with his chief of political police. On July 4th, Rolao Preto was arrested and brought to Lisbon, where he was kept in solitary confinement. On July 11th, the Council of Ministers agreed to exile Manzares and Preto for six months, and 18 days later, the ministers formally dissolved the movement. There was no large-scale or even serious resistance to the dissolution of the party, but one leader of the National Syndicalist warned Salazar that its members would not go down without a fight, and he invoked the recent assassination of Austrian Chancellor Engelbert Dolfus, who we will cover in later episodes, at the hands of the Nazis as an example of what could happen to him. Rolao Preto would never leave the anti-Salazar camp, and during World War II, he anxiously awaited for fascist Italy and National Socialist Germany to roll across the Pyrenees into Spain and to help, in his mind, liberate Portugal from Salazar's watered-down revolution. Of course, this would never occur, and instead, Preto would, like most other fascists in the world, abandon fascism by the end of the war. In 1949, Rolao Preto would, unsuccessfully, lend his support in the presidential election to General Norton de Matos. Preto would go on to dabble in leftist politics and then helped create the People's Monarchist Party in 1974 before dying in 1977. In 1994, he was posthumously awarded the Great Cross of the Order of Prince Henry the Navigator, an honor which Salazar, his longtime opponent, would never receive. And with that, we will come to a close on episode 1.6. Next up will be a supplemental episode to this one, where I will cover the intelligence and security apparatus of the Estado Novo, as well as a look into the punishments doled out by the new state, because while Salazar is routinely given a bad name and made out to be a mini Hitler of sorts, I think you'll be surprised to learn just how lenient he was, especially when compared to other authoritarians during this time. Tune in next time for episode 1.6a, where we will cover the intelligence and security apparatus of the Portuguese Estado Novo. Until then, this is Green Tea with D-Man.